All right. Hello, everybody. We finally have a Moodle page. Uh, lots of uh, lots of confusion and stuff. Uh, turns out, well, first of all, I, I really wasn't added to the roster or anything until we got the email last week. Um, once I was added, apparently my uh, my Moodle section for what I thought was my other course ended up having both both sections, and I'm really treating them as two different courses, but. The system treated them as the same course, so then I had to uh, stop that, break it apart, and redo it so that I could do my notes a little different for for each of you. Uh, so once I was through that confusion, we now have a page. Um, and so I'm going to take a couple minutes to show you a few of the resources and kind of show you the layout, what to expect for the page. Uh, new and improved little uh, photos on the top. That's kind of fun. Um, it's going to help me recognize at a glance which one, which section is which. Um, okay, so our page here, if you go to the introduction section, we've got the syllabus. Should be the, the most current. I'll uh, note if there's been changes, um, so you can see that there. I'm going to give you a formula and tables um, file here. And uh, I actually have three files here, and I'm, I'll probably have to correct this, but essentially, uh, what I want to do is give you access to each of the formula and table sheets that you'll have on the exams. So there's one for the final exam, which is I think the one that was showing, for exam number two, and for uh, your first exam. And so I'm going to set that one. So I think that now it should show you what you'll have on exam number one um, if you were to click, click this link. And so we'll just take a quick look at that. So you've got a periodic table, you've got um, a table with densities, one I commented on in class the other day. Uh, so pay, pay good attention to the units. And then you're going to have these formulas. So essentially, you'll have a few things uh, pertaining to sedimentation, coagulation, flocculation, um, particle removal stuff. And that's really, really what you're going to need to know. Um, so some of the formulas and stuff we derived today, I'm going to expect you to be able to derive that type of stuff for the whole course. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but here's what you do have so you can know what you need to commit to memory otherwise. And generally, my expectation is that if it's something that uh, is really obvious and imperative for the whole class like and, and simple enough, you should just know it. Okay. So there's some things like that. Um, we'll talk about it in a moment, and all so those will those will be available there. Uh, I've posted some practice problems from the book. This is an Excel sheet, so feel free to download that and take a look. Um, it essentially goes through um, chapter by chapter, topic by topic, uh, different problems to look look to if you wanted more more practice. Uh, let's see. Had something to say about that. I feel like I had something else to say. I lost it. Uh, it'll come back up. So then I've got a, uh, a part for assignments here. If I post any um, uh, particularly outstanding reading, which I, I have done, uh, we'll talk about this. I'd like you to read that. Um, it's not in lieu of our first class, but this is something I will like. I will have you read. I'll, I'll give you some sort of a deadline. It'll probably be before the second exam um, to take a look at this. It pertains to different um, drinking water treatment operations and a big failure, public health crisis um, for a cryptosporidium outbreak. So that'll be a that'll be an interesting read, at least to kind of see the essence of what happened. It's a good report here. It's very sciencey, so I'm not expecting you to take every bit of information, but I want you to um, want you to take a look. We'll talk about it later. Uh, but I'll post those. I'll post your homeworks in this section. You can see I have um, previous ones built in. I just need to update, edit, and reveal them to you. And I'll post the solutions there as well. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the basics 
um, here. And then below that, we have dif different sections for as we go. Um, and so far, we have kind of the slides for the intro day, that lecture, mini lecture we had. Um, the next set of slides, that lecture, um, these are YouTube links that should pop up our um, uh, just the, the lecture posted to YouTube. And then um, today, essentially, this would be our PowerPoint slides for today, and it should be blank. And I'll post that link later. All right, so there you have it. You have, um, you have sections, you have some organization here, and I'll be kind of talking you through it as we, as we go um, through the different sections. Uh, any questions, concerns, comments about, about all that? Okay. Probably be giving you a first homework next week. I'm gonna be traveling this weekend, um, Labor Day, and uh, I expect that I'll, I'll post something for you um, for practice. We'll submit it in Moodle. Um, that'll be sometime, probably sometime next week. All right, so today I want to pick up kind of where we left off. I think we were looking at um, a slide kind of showing the different um, reactors. And really, we, we took a look at the batch reactor, which was just a, a little chamber, the, the bottle. We have a CSTR, so that this would be batch. We had a CSTR, which we see here. It's continuously stirred. It's a tank. It's got water flowing in, water flowing out. So it's a continuous flow system. And then we have a plug flow reactor, which is kind of like a, a pipe or maybe a snaking chamber with water flowing through plug flow reactor. So I want to dig into each of these and um, walk you through the der derivation of a mass balance for them so we can understand how are we going to use a materials balance in order to solve for, let's say, how much chlorine do we need to add? Or what's, what's the status of the, the particles? What are they going to look like after set number of time or flow rate of um, operation? Okay. So, first of all, we need to talk about reactions. So, a reaction is going to be independent of the reactor itself, right? So, if I have a reaction happening in my bottle, maybe it's chlorine killing organisms, it doesn't matter what the bottle looks like, right? It could be water flowing through it, and if there's chlorine there, it's killing the organisms. It could be just sitting here for, for hours and hours. It could be a swimming pool. It's the same reaction. So the reaction is not connected to the reactor. That, that's my point here. So, it's, um, so for a moment, we're going to be talking about the reactions and how to describe them mathematically. Then we're going to put those into particular reactors and describe the materials balance of the total. So for the, just the reaction itself, we have three reaction orders that are common. Uh, two of which we'll, we'll be dealing with. The second order reactions we're pretty much not going to bother with for the most part. Okay, so we have a first order reaction, a zero order reaction, and a second order reaction. So if we do zero, first, and second, we could describe kind of what that looks like um, for each of these cases. For zero order, we have some concentration of stuff, and it's going to change over time. So we have a graph showing the concentration over time. For zero order, that means we have a constant change. It's changing, but the rate at which it's changing does not change. Right? So the, the derivative of this is, is constant. Um, that, could, that would be a decay reaction, or we could have some growth reaction, something like that. Okay? And we talked a bit about that last time, I believe, right? Did I, did I do these drawings? I didn't, right? I did. Okay, I'm sorry. I, since I'm teaching the two classes, I'm, um, I remember now. So we talked about how the second order is going to be really rapid, all of that. Okay, so we, we touched that, um, and we derived kind of how to look at the units for each, right? We talked about zero order being the milligrams per liter per second, or really that concentration per time. 
Okay, so that way, when we take when we take that, it just ma it fits into our into the units here. We did that for first order, and we I think we stopped here. The second order. This was a slide I thought I was starting on. Here was that slide I was, I was meaning to to start on, where we had the three different the batch the CSDR plug flow reactor. Okay. Well, a little extra review there. So we talked about the reactions last time. That's the that chlorination that could be in a swimming pool, could be in a hose pipe, could be in my bottle, whatever it is, right? Now we'll talk about the actual reactors themselves, and we'll start with batch reactors and take a look at what a materials balance would look like. All right, first of all, we're going to deal with ideal reactors. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll show you an example of a non-ideal reactor, um, just kind of as an example. But for the most part, we're going to keep the math simple in terms of the reactor. We're going to assume it's ideal. So if we've got a batch reactor, that means we've got some amount of water and it's mixing and we're going to assume it's perfectly mixed. So at no time is there a difference in concentration just because the mixture is, you know, if we add something, it's perfectly mixed. Instantly, it's, it's all the way um, distributed. It's perfect, perfect mixing. Um, so for a batch reactor, we have no input or outputs by definition. So for a batch reactor, the input goes to zero, the output goes to zero. And so our accumulation is whatever reaction is happening. So if there's no reaction, there's no accumulation, it's just boring, nothing's happening. But typically, if we're talking about a batch reactor, we're using that uh, to describe some reaction. And we're going to look at that accumulation rate in that volume. So each chamber is going to have some volume. And we'll describe it as dc dt. And then we'll set that equal to some reaction, as we'll, we'll put in there in a few minutes, in that volume. So the, uh, the batch reactor system becomes very simple. It's actually a very handy way to analyze chemical or biological reactions or really any reactions because it is so simple. Uh, it's, that's all you have to deal with is you've got that volume and the volume actually cancels out. When what you're left with is the change in concentration with change in time is all based on whatever reaction term you have there. So. Those different reaction terms we talked about last time will go straight into here based on the zero order, first order, whatever. That's all it is. So we'll derive uh, a couple examples in a, in a minute. For a CSTR, we have um, similarly some uh, batch looking system, except we have a flow going in and a flow going out. So we have an input and an output. So this time, um, you know, and let me just add one more thing to the batch. Essentially, if there's a reaction, the accumulation is never zero. So um, by definition, that means that we're not at steady state if there's a reaction. A lot of times we will deal with steady state systems. But by definition, a batch reactor cannot be at steady state um, if, the, if we've got a reactor, reaction. OK, so for a CSTR, if we're at steady state, we can set the accumulation to 0. So we'll say if at steady state. This accumulation is zero, and that will simplify our system. Doesn't have to be, um, and generally we will describe the accumulation in the same manner, dc dt, in that volume. Might be zero, might not be, but it's going to be equal to the inputs minus the outputs plus whatever reactions are happening. So typically we'll describe inputs as q for flow rate, C for some concentration, or maybe we'll use N if we're counting the number of something. This would be the uh, initial concentration, so C naught, and have some sort of out with Q and C. So here we would have Q, C coming in, minus Q, C going out, plus 
in that volume whatever reaction terms we have. Okay. One thing to note here is in a perfectly mixed system, because we have an ideal reactor, anytime our C enters the chamber, it is perfectly mixed and immediately the concentration drops. So if we're tracking the concentration as a function of like distance, it's going, it's going, it's going through the pipe, suddenly it hits the reactor, the concentration, if we're, if we're removing stuff with a reaction, it's gonna drop immediately. And then whatever the concentration is inside of here, because it's perfectly mixed, is the same concentration that's going out. As be, because of the definition of a, a perfectly mixed reactor. Um, now, maybe we have a reaction in there that's constantly destroying this concentration. That's giving us a drop, but it should be doing it at the same, time, same amount over time if we're at steady state. And so we just have a drop. It's an immediate drop, it's kind of convenient. And again, that, that does assume that it's perfectly mixed, so there's no short circuiting of some of this concentration just goes straight to the exit. So you could you could imagine designing a very very poorly designed reactor where you have like a little hose pipe coming in the top and a hose pipe leaving the leaving the top and not very good mixing, all that water on the bottom is never gonna go anywhere. It's just gonna sit there stagnant, and you just have water short circuiting through the top and out the top, right? So that would be a non-ideal system, and we're assuming that's not happening. Okay, last one is a plug flow reactor. And here we have um, kind of, there's a couple ways to look at it. The simplest would be to, to think of it as a tiny little um, chunk of liquid is gonna act like a batch reactor. It's gonna flow through the entire system. Uh, so, did I, did I give you the analogy of a hose pipe last time? Like a, a garden hose? Okay, probably didn't. Um, so a good way to think of a plug flow reactor is if you've ever taken a, um, like a garden hose in your yard or something and you turn it on and there's hot water because it's been sitting in the sun. And then if you wanted to use it, let's say, uh, I don't know, to refresh, you know, let's say you wanted to drink out of it as a kid. Um, so you're not, gonna, you're not gonna drink it while it's hot. So you have to wait and wait and wait until it pushes out all that water and then you get like the, the cooler tap water from inside or from underground or wherever. Um, well, really that's acting like a plug flow reactor because that, that slug of water that comes out first has just been sitting in there, has not been mixing with what's at the, what's at the start. So the, the deal of a plug flow reactor is there's no mixing between plugs, okay? It's just mixed within that plug but it's not mixing with what's at the end of the pipe. And so the, the warm hose pipe is a good example because it's like immediately, as soon as you reach the water, it's cooling. And, and finally, now it's ready. Um, so that's the deal with a plug flow reactor. We assume that there's just this infinitely small little batch reactor that's just flowing along on a conveyor belt. And then when it reaches the end, um, it pours out of the reactor. So at the start, we have that's time zero, and it's gonna spend some amount of time in the reactor. We would call that, um, and this, this drawing calls it tau. Our book is gonna call it theta. And that's our hydraulic retention time. And that's gonna be essentially equal to the volume of the chamber divided by the flow rate of the chamber. Okay, so that's one of those common equations that I expect you to, to have in memory for the class, okay? It's the amount of time water is gonna spend there depends on how quickly it's flowing through it and how big the chamber is. With those two pieces of information, um, you should be able to derive it just based on the units because you know you have to have time and that has to be some function of the volume and the flow rate. If you can just commit that to memory, then you'll notice that uh, the only arrangement that can make sense is, let's say you have cubic meters, it would be cubic meters divided by cubic meters per, let's say, second. So that ends up giving you just seconds. The cubic meters will cancel. 
So theta is V over Q. Um, and I'm re just reminded now, because this the theta is what our book uses, and I'm reminded that um, I learned last week that there is an electronic copy of the international version of our book. Um, I don't know how to access it. I just know that yeah, I've seen it. I've, somebody told me about it. So I can't share with you the details of like how to get it. And I, I don't think I, it would be uh, ethical for me to like give you give you the copy that somebody showed me. But it's out there. So um, take a look. I can't promise it matches the, the, the page numbers or the example numbers or any of that. Um, but feel free to, to take take a look for that. Okay. So, but back to the reactor. Um, and that's, that's by the way, what I was trying to think of earlier, I was going to say. <laughs> Came back. Um, okay. So, back to the reactor, though. This is a pretty convenient reactor because we can do the batch-style kinetics while having a continuous flow. And we can even do it in steady state in, in terms of the reactor itself because the reactor itself could have a constant process, the same amount going in, the same amount going out, the same change in concentration inside, even if that little plug does not have steady state. Okay, So when we think of it, the math is going to work out the same as a batch reactor that's just staying active for some amount of time equal to theta. So we're going to derive the math for batch reactors and then derive the math for CSTRs to incorporate an equation into the, the um, mass balance and kind of explore that a little bit. But for the plug flow reactors, we just leave it as sort of mass, mass balance of a batch reactor, except we substitute in the hydraulic retention time instead of just how much time did I leave it sitting here on my desk, right? That's, that's the difference. Does that make sense? Okay, so just a quick elaboration on that hydraulic uh, detention time and a, a little link we can take a look at. So our hydraulic detention time, I said it, theta is V over Q. That's going to be um, volume per flow rate. <clears throat> and I'm going to pull up this as well. Sorry about that. 